enjoy Tornady. You might say accuracy is my business. I make bullets. You are listening to the Hornady Podcast. Thanks for joining us and enjoy the show. Hello, everyone. Thanks for tuning in to the Hornady Podcast. I'm your host, Seth Swerzik. Thanks for joining us today. Before we get started, I need to point out, of all the listeners and of all the, the views on YouTube, and we get a lot of views on YouTube, 75% of the views consumed on YouTube are not by subscribers. So if you're enjoying this content on YouTube and you're in that 75%, it doesn't cost you anything. It's a free button to click. Hit the subscribe button. It helps us out a ton, and uh, we'd sure appreciate it. So with that administrative stuff out of the way, uh, I'm joined across the table today by some uh, uh, big names here at Hornady Manufacturing, the Director of Engineering. And well, yours is a big name. It's long, long. <laughs> yeah, it's long. The Director of Engineering, Mitch Middlestead, and Director of Marketing, Neil Davies. Guys, thanks for coming on. Yeah. Thank you, Seth. So... We get the big names here, and it's not because of your, your, your status within the company, but it has more to do with your uh, tenure here at the company because there's a product that is almost, I'm going to call it a sleeper, if you will, um, in the last mm, nine, eight years, something like that. This cartridge has been in our top five of rifle cartridges sold every single year. And it really blows me away because I don't necessarily see it being that widespread, but the reality is it is that widespread and it does have a very specific purpose. And uh, we're talking about 450 Bushmaster. Yeah, and Mitch, Mitch was the guy back in the day. Uh, you were a project engineer back then, right? right? Yeah, yep. so Mitch designed the 450 Bushmaster. Yeah, we need to set the stage though. So before we get started talking about all the development, all the cool stuff, this was a really neat time to be in the industry, or in high school for me. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think he just called us old. Yeah, yeah, to set yeah. the stage for uh, for the industry, though, you had that so-called assault weapons ban that expired in 2004. So 2004, 2005, six, seven, eight. You had this rapid development in the AR platform, and there was just a lot of cool stuff going on with that, and for good reason. It's a neat platform. It right? was that was a good time. I mean. I, I just left the Marine Corps and came and started working at Hornady, and that's exactly what happened. I mean, it was AR everything. That's when three guns started to kind of happen, and right. new product development on the AR side was just, I mean, there was cottage industries all over the place. Um, and, you know, hats off to some of the OGs out there. I mean, John Paul, uh, uh, Uncle... Uncle Randy Luth at DPMS and then Bushmaster were always in the mix. You know, they, they'd always been, been making ARs regardless, obviously Colt at the time too. Right. But then once that, uh, ban, which <laughs> well, really wasn't much of yeah. an actual ban, and that's where both Neil and I are old enough because you were still in high school, Seth, right? to recall the assault weapons ban where you had to pay attention to the flash hider and the bayonet lug and the front sight and all these specifications that they put in the assault weapons ban, which really didn't change anything at all. They just changed the firearm configuration. You could still yeah. purchase them, but for some reason they still really weren't they were just gaining the popularity that they have now. Yeah, yeah, and they weren't used much in the... There's people that use them for high-power shooting. There were people that used ARs for hunting purposes, but it wasn't widespread like it is now. I mean, there, there was lots of them. I had one that was a pre-ban H-bar or whatever it was back in the day, and you had to pay attention to what serial number you had and all those types of things. But yeah, in 04... Boom! It was just an explosion. Yeah, and that's you have the collapsible butt stocks and the grips and the right. and the it, just all the accessories and all that stuff. So by the time I got involved, it was and we were at war. So it's true. there was a lot of things that were being created and crafted that were uh, you know for the war fighter that then made their way because ergonomically it just made a lot of sense. And you know this is a sporting rifle. It's used for lots of different things. It's mm -hmm. used for hunting. It's used for personal protection. It's used for marksmanship training. It's used for all sorts of things. Yeah, yeah it's just fantastic. Yeah, and it is a lot of fun to shoot and play around with. And so to further set the stage, um, there's some names that I'm learning about, but also uh, uh, that have been kind of sounds like shooting legends. Uh, Jeff Cooper, uh, we talked about before we started recording and uh, all the work that he had done and kind of propagating this thumper type mindset. 
uh, or or goal for a rifle system. Yeah, and that I mean Jeff Cooper's a legend. Um, Jeff Cooper, Colonel in the Marine Corps, founded Gunsight, um, created a bunch of <laughs> shooting drills, and is kind of the 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 modern uh, the the forefather of most you know tactical training that we all kind of use today. I mean somehow or another everything that's taught kind of goes back to principles that he put forth whether he was the originator or whether he just popularized them he gets credit for a lot of the stuff that is just incorporated into all sorts of handgun personal protection tactical training today yeah. and um jeff cooper wrote the book to ride shoot straight and tell the truth and in that book he first mentions this concept of the umper and that's basically a a short carbine length semi-automatic large caliber gun he didn't even necessarily mean an ar-15 it could have been any other yeah lever action or platform something. to handle that but um and that's when he brought that out and i don't even know when that book came out but it was somewhere around that time frame. Okay. and he was also a big fan of, i mean he's you know the scout rifle concept is something right. he kind of dreamt up and it was a you know all-purpose uh rifle setup i mean and there's been several companies to date that have that have done that with Ruger. scout scopes mm -hmm. um and incorporated that design into popular models today you can use it for um, hunting purposes self-protection etc cetera, etc cetera. it's great awesome so with that thumper uh mindset uh you know there was a, a rapid development of a lot of cartridges you know uh mitch you talked earlier uh, before we started recording i mean there was a slew of them 458 mm -hmm. socom the beowulf uh, it seemed like there was just this massive, I don't know, uh, almost industry-wide uh, push for these big, hard-hitting cartridges. Right, and I think you know this was also remember the time frame of the of the 500 Smith and Wesson. So all the big, heavy for caliber stuff, 454 Casul. A couple of years later, we would have the 460 Smith and Wesson. Big caliber, heavy bullets were all the rage at this time. Awesome. So with that uh, ground level uh, information setting the scene here, let's get into uh, how this came to be. And, and one last thing before we talk about it, uh, the way that we as a company, Hornady, design and introduce a new cartridge today is significantly more refined than what it used to be. And so uh, within this podcast, you're going to hear how things were done, gosh, you know, 15, 16 years ago. Did you know that Hornady has a full line of reloading tools and equipment? Whether you're brand new to the reloading game or a seasoned veteran, we have tools that will work awesome with your setup. Check out all of Hornady's reloading tools at Hornady.com. Well, we, we talked about Black Ops and how we've done product development, some of the previous podcasts, and there's still a little bit of that that goes on, but yeah, we have still is. better testing capabilities and we're able to flesh out things a lot better now than we were back in the you know early 2000s. Right. right. I mean, we, we really focus on now on nailing down those technical details of a new cartridge, pressure, velocity, barrel length, bullet weights before we even let the marketing guys know anything. Yeah. yeah. Because we don't want any... We don't want to have to update or, you know, oh, we've updated the specs because that happened a lot a long time ago. It happened to every company. Mm -hmm. you know, this is just the way. It was just the way that, you know, people were trying to get to the market as quickly as possible and they would make estimations and then they would put it in the, you know, I was, I was actually going through my notes of the hiss and we were sending, you know, performance estimations to gun riders six months before we even had a pressure yeah. barrel scott rupp if you're out there this was uh this is <laughs> this is one of the ones that you're a part of yeah so uh it's a, a great time to be in the industry new cartridges are being developed new in developments for the rifle system as a whole are coming out like crazy and now we've got tim legender and he's got a cartridge that's called the 45 pro or the 45 professional right and where does that fall and how did you get involved mitch well, that was something that he had worked on, and I'm not sure the exact time on, on what he had done, but he, he had a friend at Bushmaster. His name was Israel Anzaldua. Is, That's another is name. Yeah. Is. Um, is is still in the business. I'm not sure where he's at now, but yeah, I, I, I talked to him, him a couple years ago. 
Um, but I'm sure he's still out there, probably working with ARs. Cause he, and Izzy was good buds with uh, Wayne Holt. Right. Yeah. Who was our director of marketing back then, director of sales and marketing. Yeah. So Izzy got with Tim Legender on that. And what Tim had was he took the 284 Winchester case. So it's a approximately 500 diameter case with a rebated head down to 308 diameter. And um, he had cut that off at about 1.8, 1.88, somewhere in there. And um, he was loading it with 200 and 230 grain FMJ bullets that are basically made for the 45 auto. Okay. So he's running these things at like 2,500 feet per second, even up to 2,800 I had in my notes. Oh, wow. And, uh, and yeah, and it was running. He's like, yeah, I think we're running it at like 55,000 PSI. I'm like, well, you can't do that in the AR platform. Well, it works fine. Well, well, in, in some probably small limited cases and like most wildcats and this is something that you know everybody's heard and we'll tell the story again most wildcats are optimistic on their performance mm -hmm. specs they don't have pressure measuring equipment uh maybe they have a strain gauge but even that's only plus or minus 15 percent so you know he's got this wildcat and it's really hot and uh you know so he took that to bushmaster they called us this is Clear back in May of 05. Way so, back. Yeah. So we took a look at that and, um, you know, we started working on, I've got some notes because I had to go back and read my notes because this is 17 years ago. So I don't remember any well, of this off my head. Thanks for good notes. <laughs> um, and so we started looking at it in May of 05. And then, you know, we got, we then built, I don't even think we even built a rifle. We were working on getting Bushmasters to, actually make some barrel blanks and then it just i've just found that it just kind of that project just fell by the wayside and that's what happens in the industry as well you know things pop up you talk about them for a couple months and nobody's really too fired up about it um you, you know because you really have to have the firearm side and the ammo side mm -hmm. um and when you and you have to get both sides really fired up and ready to go on it and then it just kind of sat for a while and then we didn't pick it up again until late 06, uh, about October of 06. And uh, that's when Bushmaster decided they want to do it. That's when Steve Hornady, you know, so that's Well, we had other things group. going on, too, historically then. Oh, yeah. It was a, 05 was uh, Lever Evolution at the time, I think. So. Oh, and 308 Marlin Express, yeah. 338 Marlin Express. Well, they Express. happened kind of subsequent. I think, I think Lever Evolution happened about... 04 for five. So we would have introduced mm -hmm. it in the fall of 04 for 05. So that was a big one. That was a big Huge. advent for us. Obviously, flex tip projectiles. That was right. a new advent for the industry and us uh, in particular. I still remember Millard filming Millard with a oh, tube. Yeah. With the <laughs> yeah, just uh, dropping it. Yeah, showing our drop test to show you that the, the flex tips don't ignite primers. So, but yeah, so there was a lot of that going right. on too. It wasn't necessarily just industry ho-hum we we had yeah. others oh we yeah were, well and that whole era not just for the ar but you looking at 2004 2005 to 2010 a lot of cartridges the cartridges that were developed of cartridges. Uh, the creedmoor the 30 tc uh rcms i mean there's a bunch right i mean yeah so that was a very fun time for us we just had new cartridges coming all the time lots of development we did the e75 Five. ruger at the time Oh seven. Um, yeah. So there was just a lot of fun things going on. We had a lot of new cartridges coming coming to the market at that time. So actually, um, Neil did mention flex tips. So when we took a look at the 450 on the 45 Pro, when we brought that back up, um, in 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 late 06, we're like, well, we've got these new flex tips. We've got these FTX bullets. We had built a 250 grain FTX. 452 cal that we were using in a sabo in a mm -hmm. black powder load yeah uh having really good performance with that you know if you if you used three of the you know hodgdon pellets you got 21 2200 feet per second so we had already proven that projectile out in this velocity range well and that and sorry to inter interrupt you but like the thing that we didn't understand when we did the flex tips the, the goal there with the ftx bullets was to put this soft polymer tip on the front end of a bullet only uh, to make sure that we didn't ignite primers in a, 
you know, in, in, in any kind of fed. inline configuration. So in a tubular magazine, right? That was our goal. What we found out later by doing a bunch of uh, gel testing is, is that flex tip is, is soft. Mm-hmm. So it right. acts, you know, the, the kind of the analogy I give, it, it's like a water balloon. If you, if you push on a water balloon from any side, it starts to push outward. So that flex tip has a great uh, advantage for low velocity uh, impacts because it's going to help those bullets open up at lower velocity. Right. So that's, that was a, again, you know, we, we lucked out on that deal. I mean, yeah. that wasn't, that wasn't what we designed it for, but right. boy, that was an incidental success. Yeah. Home run there. Right. So when we, so when we took that 250 grain flex tip and we looked at the design pr- parameters of the cartridge and to, to be able to load that into the 450 Bushmaster, which we wanted to be in the 2.26 AR mag length. Mm, we yeah. had to stick with that. So that's your max max. You, you can't move outside that number. Then when you put the 250 grain FTX in there and its head height, which is the cartridge mouth to the cartridge overall length, the space that you had for the ogive and the tip of the projectile, we had to shorten the cartridge case down to about 1.7. And so when we did that, that's when it departed that's that's when it truly became the 450 boob bushmaster and was not just a redo of the 45 professional okay we then shortened it down so you had more flexibility in the projectiles that you could use you could still use the shorter 200 and 230 grain projectiles if you wanted to uh but we really optimized it to fit that flex tip and then you could also use up to 300 grain ftx would fit in there you could put the xtp mag that we make in there uh, that, you know, really, cause we re- we looked at the cartridge as something that we didn't just want to load the lightweight bullets. We wanted to be able to get the heavies in there as well. Sure. So that's when we shortened it up to 1.7 and that's, that's when the envelope was, you know, fixed. So I've got the, I found the original cartridge print from two. So it's dated, uh, November 15th of 06. So that's when I know we had the actual envelope picked mm-hmm. uh we still had the same 284 winchester based case but we were just cutting it to 1.7 now and uh, you know this was early on so we started yeah. to build so back then at that time you would because we were predicating that this would work on an in an ar-15 mm-hmm. so bushmaster started to make arrows send them to us we did you know the old wildcat hand load development. You look at the <laughs> primer, make sure it's not flat. Um, and we just started working with it then. And we had, you know, developed some numbers uh, by about February. We were hoping to get 2,100 feet per second from a 20 inch. Um, that was kind of the goal. And then again, they were wanting to publish these numbers. You know, they were putting it in the Bushmaster catalog. We were putting it in our catalog. They wanted to sell sheets. Scott Rupp was asking what the performance was. And, uh, I'm yeah, just... and we were, you know, we were chatting with writers at the time because typically if we would have a product that's going to launch, like in this case in 07, right? Mm-hmm. So we would have communicated with writers well in advance in 06. And uh, we were, <laughs> we probably had a handful of prototypes, and we mm-hmm. showed it to a couple of couple of folks out there, uh, even though we still didn't have quite the, you know, all the information nailed right. down. And so, yeah, we have noted here that Mitch did a lot of that design work in 2006, and we launched it as a Hornady new product for 2007. Yeah, so it had been in the catalog that we'd have printed in 06, and we'd have communicated it to customers and writers and things in 06. And then I remember taking it to the round table, the, the right. intermediate or prime media or whatever they were back then. So that's a, a conglomerate basically of guns and ammo, shooting times, rifle shooter, all, all those publications. So I used to host an event in, uh, in Barrie, Illinois mm-hmm. at uh, Dick Metcalf's place there. Yep. And shooting this gun, shooting this there. Right. Yeah. And so I'm just going to go through and give you, give, give you a couple excerpts from an email from February 1st of 07. So exactly... Uh, what would that be? 16 years ago. Yeah. Uh, from Steve Johnson, who's so, yeah. so there's so there's so there's another name. Steve's still in the industry a little little, little bit as well. Um, but he asked me because he was our sales and marketing guy. Uh, so he asked me what the specs are, and I said preliminary specs are 2,100 feet from a 20 inch barrel with a 250 grain FTX. 
And then he says, are you comfortable with that number or, or is it likely to change? And I said, well, no, I'm not comfortable with it. I hope to hell I can get there. <laughs> uh, that's, you know, and that's, and again, that's the way we did it back then. We were kind of flying by the seat of our pants, a little bit Western, uh, trying to get the hype out there too. So the marketing guys really wanted to talk about it. Uh, and we don't do that now. We right. are, we, we have our I's dotted, our T's crossed. You know, we've got things even in the can. We've got new things in the can right now waiting for the right time to introduce them. Yeah. You know, there's, but they're fully fleshed out. We've got pressure barrels. We've got, you know, a year of development. Yeah, multiple pressure barrels. Right. But and never enough prototype product. But yeah. that's another oh, exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. Never enough. So, and so, in you know, going back through my notes. So that's, that's the first of February in 07. And then we didn't get a pressure barrel till the middle of March. So we can't even start doing load development in earnest and really confirm these numbers until, until. March. And, uh, and I had my notes that the Bushmaster had originally scheduled to start shipping production rifles in April. Mm. Well, there's no way in hell that yeah. was going to happen. So um, that's crazy. Yeah. So finally got the pressure barrel, uh, started doing the load work on it, confirmed we could get the 2,100 feet per second. We actually ended up getting 2,200 feet per second. Uh, there's a few p- p- powders that work well in this, you know, the Magnum pistol powders, H110, W297. Um, those seem to work the best in this in um, this cartridge. And then we still had, you know, Bushmaster was trying to push us to get, you know, get more speed, more speed. And, um, you know, we, ha- we had the discussion on uh, bolt thrust in the AR-15. Yeah, we need to talk about Which, that because this has got that rebated rim, right, from the 284 Winchester, right. And so, how you calculate bolt thrust is the inside diameter of the cartridge case times the amount of pressure you're going to run that at. Well, when you look at the numbers, and we had already seen the 68 SBC had came out just a few years prior to this, and the 762 Colt had chambered some some ARs in 762 by. 39 will bolt the 68 if you remember of course you were in high school Seth so you probably don't <laughs> 68 when it first came out would eat AR15 bolts like popcorn just shearing lugs off shearing lugs off okay cuz they it was a higher pressure round they hadn't they had just basically tried to take the same technology from regular 556 five, AR bolt turn it out make it bigger and this is when we start getting into shot peen bolts and ultra hard, I can't even name the steel specs, but now almost all bolts like 6.5 Grendel bolts and arc bolts are made to this new harder spec. And uh, so, we, so we knew that they had had issues with the 6.8 when it came out. And so we set the bolt thrust to match what the 6.8 is because it's a slightly larger head than a 5.56. You know, mm-hmm. 6.8's a 416, 420 head size. Um, take that times 55,000 PSI because they kept it at that pressure. Well, that set the bolt thrust, and I'm going to pull a number out. I think it's like 5,000 pounds, 5,500 pounds of straight back bolt thrust. So when you back calculate that on the 450 Bushmaster, that brings you clear down to like 38,000 PSI. but it turns out that is enough pressure to push that 250 at about 2,200 feet per second. So it worked um, out. So we still have, that's why the Bushmaster in an AR still works fine. You'll get longevity um, because we're not overstressing the lugs on and, the And you AR-15 make it a cartridge that's a little more amenable to a bunch of different systems because you don't have to rely on special metallurgy to, yeah, to, right. to, to get longevity out of your bolt. Yeah, well, and I'll be the first to say it. I've shot a bunch of 450 Bushmaster in my short time working uh, in in ballistics. Shot a lot of it, and none of it was that particularly fun. So I can't imagine a 250 (laughs) frame bullet at 55,000 pounds or even 52,000 pounds because the the recoil on a bolt gun specifically can be uh, aggressive, to say the least. Yeah, it's a heavy bullet. Mm -hmm. Right. That's the whole point. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, So that was a good point, though, to, to... dive into that bolt thrust because we haven't talked about that on the podcast at all uh even in the, like the six arc podcast i don't think we dove into that one but mm. uh for the listener out there that's a good little piece of information to have and also explains or not explains but kind of gives a peek behind the curtain that even though the traditional way of doing a new cartridge intro that we do now 
was a little bit different back then. We still weren't completely flying by the seat of our pants. There was still a oh, lot yeah. being done. Yeah. No, yeah, but was, you've got a lot to work with on an AR. I mean, you've got timing issues, you've got buffers, you've got mm-hmm. springs, you've got there's gas all system manner of things. Yeah, yeah. And, and gas system length and gas port diameter. I mean, there's a lot of things that have to work in concert to make sure that that thing is functioning correctly. Yep. Right. And that's probably the biggest struggle. So we did, I, I do remember going back and forth with, with a boob Bushmaster. We actually helped them develop the rifle itself. By We changed a little bit in the weight of the bolt carrier was one option, but we ended up not having to actually do that in production. Uh, we then did the different locations for the gas port, whether it was a pistol or carbine. So even on the 20-inch guns, they still used a carbine length gas port just because you've got such a large bore volume compared to a 5.56 or any smaller caliber. You've just got this huge volume you have to fill up, and you have to siphon enough gas off to get that action to run. Um, so even on the 20-inch gun, still use a carbine length gas port because you try to put it further out. We had built some rifle links early on, and they just wouldn't run. You couldn't get enough gas because even though it sounds like you've got a lot of volume, you really don't because you're still at the lower pressure. We're trying to run that lower yeah. pressure, and you've just got so much more volume to spread that pressure over that you can't get enough sucked off and back to run the action. Sure, and that's, uh, yeah, and just a remarkable, uh, like I, we've been talking about, just a remarkable time to be in the AR industry and to flush all this stuff out. And to have a guy like Mitch who's, you know, actually quite the AR aficionado yeah. so that was that was very helpful yeah. yeah so and that i mean this was a this was a you know dream project for me i had uh first got my ar back when i first started at hornady like in that 99 so i actually did purchase one on the assault weapons band but it was like a 24 inch varmint gun you know bull barrel 223 i shot prey dogs with it for a couple of years and then when it, when we did the 204 Ruger, I also built a heavy barrel one of those, and it's still my favorite Prairie Dog gun. Um, and that right there is actually one of the first three Bushmaster prototype uppers. That's actually my lower that's on there now. But yeah, look at uh, that barrel. I was gonna say, yeah, that barrel. yeah, yeah, yeah that's, that's pretty that's nasty. A turned I mean, it's barrel. Hand, yeah, it's like a turned barrel, hand polished in the tool room. Yeah, uh, we got some four ends sent to us by her fire. Um, yeah, and okay. if you close the bolt, why don't you close the bolt just to just to show the folks? It's got a number three etched on it because that's how we <laughs> kept track of which ones, which bolt we had. So yeah, so I think Steve Hornady's got number one. I think number two is still in the lab, and uh, I've got number three. That's pretty darn cool. And you've got the hog loophole. Yeah, to go the hog there. loophole. That's a piece of history sitting right up here on yeah. the table. That's pretty darn cool. And so doing all this development, you really got you targeted that twenty inch barrel length. Mm. Um, what do you gain by going to 20? What do you lose by going um, shorter? Well, and so you can see that one there is a 16, and that's where I really think the sweet spot is. Yeah, I mean, don't a, lose much for that. 20 inch barrel is going 2200. 20 um, one inch barrel is only going 20 or a 16 inch. Excuse me, 16 inch barrel you only lose 100 foot, and that's still plenty. You can kill plenty of hogs or deer, or whatever, at 2100 foot per second. Yeah. Um, and then strangely enough. Then that's my that's my SBR 450 Bushmaster. I think there's probably not too many ten and a half inch 450 <laughs> Bushmasters <laughs> out there, but probably not. So right so there. for all you NFA folks, that actually is a registered SBR lower with my name on it that I did a form one on. Uh, so I built uh, so it was right around that time frame. So in like '09, I think I found my notes. I found that we only or that when I cut it down to ten and a half inches. I'm still getting 1875 out of it. Really? Yeah, so it loses nothing. So mm. pretty much all the powder is burned up in the first six yeah. inches. Well, you're, and, uh, it's 30 grains of powder or so, yeah. but you're still, it's H110 yeah. or 296. I mean, it, it lights up like that. Yeah. Pretty, pretty remarkable. And so all that cool design, everything was great. And then, uh, I don't want to say the wheels fell off, but there was a, a, a series of years in there that the popularity um, of the cartridge maybe didn't wane, but I feel like the rifle support, this is probably about the time I entered the industry, right? was really kind of went downhill a little bit. Well, and I think this is the time frame when 
Bushmaster got yeah. sold to Remington. Or Cerberus or whomever. DPMS got sold. There's a lot of call consolidation happening in there, and everybody went back to kind of the mainstream calibers again. It was five, five, six, and two, two, three. And so there was a rifle from Bushmaster. A couple of the custom ARs guys were getting into it, but uh, it really didn't get picked up and embraced by the AR crowd like we wanted it to. I mean, it, it was still fairly popular, but just not off the charts it was just mm-hmm. like a steady it was a ni- it was kind of a niche product right, if you wanted right. to if you were gonna go pig hunting this is oh yeah obviously a great choice for anybody down in texas or in the southeast that's gonna go hunt pigs yeah great for deer great for all sorts of things literally but, knock them over i mean yeah right. that was that was kind of the it shtick you know as far as yeah. on the hunting side that's where it worked best yeah and then q the Man. change to a lot of the muzzleloader seasons and people could start to use yeah. straight wall cartridges. Straight wall cartridge cases. Yeah, that was, we were talking about this earlier. I don't remember the years where that really kicked off, but I right. want to say 2015, maybe. Somewhere in that range. Yeah. It was like a rocket sled on rails for you know, Iowa, Indiana, Indiana Michigan. Ohio, Michigan. Yeah. yeah, all those states. It just blew up. And, you know, you look at states like that, like Michigan, for example, or Ohio, or like the the populations of those states are, are rather large and the hunting population, it's, it's, you know, it's a very right. culturally accepted thing. So you have these really high number of hunters that can now use these straight wall cartridges and what you designed as an AR-15 cartridge is now, right. I mean, you want to talk about <laughs> yeah. reversal because it is <laughs> right. a bolt action scene, it seems like, and maybe that's just my narrow fielded uh, view, but gosh, with the Ruger American. Mm-hmm. That was the that was the official stamp of right. approval and acceptance because it uh, that that rifle solidified the 450 Bushmaster's place and prominence as the ultimate thumper in my opinion. Yeah, and those guys, you know, uh, they they really were early adopters in many regards to several things, and they've 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 hit it out of the park with some of their Ruger. Yeah, Ruger yeah. with some yeah. of the stuff that they've done like that, where they recognize like, okay, holy cow, let's do this. Let's put this right. 450 Bushmaster in a bulk gun. And when we saw that, it was, you know, kind of an eye opener. Like, wow, hey, that's cool. Yeah. We didn't even, you know, that wasn't right. even really the application we designed this thing for. But mm-hmm. based upon the parameters of the laws, made perfect sense for them. Right. Yeah. And I'm going to say at this point, bolt actions in 450 Bushmaster outsell the semi autos 100 to 1 now, probably sure. 1,000 to 1. You know, there's so many bolt actions out there. They sell so many of them. I can remember. You know, when our sales reps from those states started talking to us, hey, we got to get 450 mm. Bushmaster, you know, Ruger's going to ship, you know, 10,000 guns. Or I there was like that. one shop that ordered 5,000 guns. That's yeah, what it was. Like, yeah. That's crazy. But it's, and just like you said at the start of the podcast, Seth, I mean, it's, it's in our top 10. Yeah. Consistently still. Top five. The, top five. The, is it? Okay. It, it's probably yeah, always depending in the on top the month. 10. <laughs> but uh, yeah. I pulled the numbers or I had uh, Katie, our regional sales manager, run the numbers for me last year and then uh, two years ago. And then I saw the numbers in like, I think it was 2016 or 17. And every time I've checked, it's been within the top five. Hmm. Uh, the, this last year, it was number four. Yeah. Which it, is crazy when you I throw know. it into the cartridges like 223, 30-06, 308-65 Creedmoor. It's just, it, to me, it's remarkable that it is that popular in this, well, you know, And it's one scale. of those ones where, you know, opportunity and, you know, met with customer demand, I guess. I mean, that that's what happened here. Much like the Creedmoor, right? So the Creedmoor right. was kind of going along just fine. Then all of a sudden, the precision shooting side of everything went crazy and then it it took off like nobody's business well yeah. the 450 kind of benefited from that too because we had the cartridge built and then mm-hmm. boy we had a gun company that adopted it and utilized it for the purpose that you know we we hadn't taken uh that into consideration originally so mm-hmm. yeah it was it was really cool so now all all that all the technical stuff and the gun stuff aside i'd mentioned i shot a bunch of 450 bushmaster working in the lab and I don't know how many hundreds or possibly thousands of rounds that I've fired of it, but I've still never shot anything with it. I've never used it on a hunt. So we've got a 10 and a half inch SBR, a 16 inch uh, AR. There's bolt guns down there that I've shot. What have you guys used it on and what's, what's kind of your field experience with it? 
Because there had to be some media hunts, Neil. Well, yeah, we've yeah. done pigs. I've shot yeah, pigs with it. Yeah. I, mean, I have yet to do gun. a deer hunt someplace with it. I haven't done okay. that yet, but obviously we have people that have, but yeah. I personally haven't. I've even shot a prairie dog with it. <laughs> 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 yeah, <laughs> totally uh, more than one needs. Um, but the one thing I would say, though, like I remember going to that roundtable event in whenever it was, 07 must have been, mm-hmm. and we, were, we had a 20-inch test gun and we had a 16-inch gun. And I remember shooting the 20 inch gun at a target at 300 or whatever mm-hmm. it was. And then I went to the 16 inch barrel and shot that same target. And like, I mean, that's practical range. You don't, right. I mean, and it shot just great. Don't, you didn't need that longer barrel necessarily. Right. So that was, that was a, that was a cool experience just to see that just because of the cartridge case design, you don't lose that much in, in, in velocity if you're going to reduce it that much no and you really don't lose that in speed and that's something else that i want to bring up it is literally one overall one of the most accurate cartridges i mean it sounds strange to say that because you're not thinking of accuracy when you do that because you're because you're putting such a big projectile down the barrel but and 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 so because the big diameter it's easier to get a one whole group but i've had more of my friends and my dad and uh, a friend of mine from michigan They'll shoot one hole groups with their Bushmaster, 100 yard five shot groups, one big ragged hole. Now, big ragged hole, yeah. you know, it's it's a 45 caliber hole, so you don't have to be super accurate to get one hole. But I've seen more one hole group shot with 450 Bushmasters than I have with almost anything else. Wow, that's that's pretty remarkable. Now we're going to continue to talk about accuracy, but first let's break for a word from our sponsors, us. Look at this. A hundred free bullets when I buy these select Hornady reloading tools. Wow, 500 free bullets with certain Hornady reloading presses and kits. Well, what do they have? Let's get loaded. There's no better time to stock your reloading bench. Choose from the most durable, precise, and convenient tools on the market and receive free bullets to get you loaded. Visit Hornady.com for further details. Next time we get loaded, I'm buying... So we were talking about accuracy of the 450 Bushmaster, and I had never put a conscious thought into that. But now that you say that, Mitch, there, yeah, I, in all the shooting that I've done where we've had to uh, qualify a rifle or uh, shoot stuff from the shoulder, I don't ever remember it shooting particularly bad ever. And like it, it always stacked them up. And I know we've got a bolt gun, two bolt guns. We've got a Ruger American and a Ruger M77, and both of those things shoot lights out it that's that. i assume that cartridge case and chamber design pretty similar to what we've done with right, all the rest yeah, of them and yeah it's got you know, the going same, forward yeah it's got the same straight uh, about 125 or 200 thousandths of a throat in there which is what we put on almost all of our cartridges now uh just that chamber design everything that we've earned in all the new cartridges that yeah. we've been doing uh, I think that 452 caliber projectile is an accurate one as well. Yeah, we yeah. use it in a lot of different other we applications. Well, it's got that really long bearing surface, and that's going to help uh, with, the, you know, we just recorded a podcast about dispersion. That's going to help that thing in bore, and as it enters that forcing cone, just establish a really long wheelbase and, and keep its axis true with the bore axis, right. and, and that's going to help things as well. But terminally, uh, you know, the performance of that projectile has been tested <laughs> millions mm, yeah probably millions of times across the world at this mm-hmm. point in time because uh, it's incorporated into several other designs within you know different products that we have and you know i don't know how many white-tailed deer probably been killed with that bullet Thousands. over the years oh it's Thousands. it's it's inc- yeah it's got to be a huge number you know i i've referenced this before but the state of missouri which isn't a straight wall restricted state but this is a good example the state of missouri on opening day of their gun season last year, or two years ago, rather, 2021 is when I uh, got these numbers. Their opening day of rifle season, they killed nearly 100,000 deer. Good grief. <laughs> Nebraska, all seasons combined don't kill 70, 80, Well, 000. we don't have the same but we don't have the same habitat. Deer. And, yeah. and, and a big drought right now, which is yeah. helping us. Well, I was just saying that the, the states that are east of us, they're mm-hmm. more dense, densely wooded. Uh, more places for these animals to live. In a lot of the states, you know, they're not so ag-focused per se where they've got more places for these animals to live. And so their their number of animals that, that get that get killed every year is just monumentally high. States like Pennsylvania, right. New York, 
I mentioned Missouri. There's a bunch of others, Michigan, Wisconsin, Minnesota. And uh, I know there's a bunch of those states in there where the 450 Bushmaster is reigning supreme. Like you mentioned, Indiana, where there was that one gun shop that put in this huge order. Uh, I was still working in tech at the time, so this would have been pre-2017. Um, yeah, and I remember thinking, like, why? I don't get it. And I did, I, <laughs> at that time, I didn't connect all the dots. Yeah. But, you know, that projectile is used in our muzzle loading side. It's used in other uh, ammo loading uh, cartridges and things like that. And it's just, it's been out there for a long time and has, you know, proven itself. So p- having that projectile, obviously, in the 450 Bushmaster just, Helps it out immeasurably, mm-hmm. but we do have other options too. So one of the newest ones is our sub X loads. So oh my gosh, want, my favorite! Yeah, so if you want to shoot subsonic with your 450 Bushmaster, we have a load for you there too. Yeah, that's an important point, and I'm glad you brought that up because it escaped my mind. But the 450 Bushmaster is awesome as it is, and I I mentioned earlier that it it's a handful. I mean, it, you you know about it when you pull the trigger to sw- to swap over to the subsonic line of ammunition, you get a much heavier bullet and you think it's going to be substantial in recoil. It's like shooting a little bit louder pellet gun. These things, uh, you know, they launch at below the speed of sound. So this one's doing 1050 from the muzzle and it, the bullet weighs 350 grains, I believe. 350 or 395. Or 395, excuse me. 395. Yeah, 395 we should know grain this bullet. Off we should know. Come on, I know. fellas. I know. What's wrong with us? Uh, but that bullet specifically designed to expand. So not only do you get the, the greater, enha- or not greater, but the enhanced shooting experience, it's right. quieter, way less recoil, you don't sacrifice the terminal performance. So if you've got one of these cool guns and you want to introduce a kid or your wife, or if you just want a you know, lower recoiling shooting experience, that subsonic line is right. just awesome. Yeah, and I mean, unless you're sitting over a, a, a field or something like that, if you're in the woods and you're hunting, subsonic load would be great, where you're shooting right. 40, 50, 60, 70 yards. <laughs> It's yeah. a great choice. Yeah, I mean, these things obviously below the speed of sound, so they kind of sink like a stone once they leave the muzzle. Uh, but they will expand out to distances you have no business shooting yeah, with a subsonic right, exactly. bullet. They'll expand yeah, down to can... 800, 850 feet. Right. And that's, you know, and that whole subsonic line is an expansion of our handgun technology because we've got the critical defense and critical duty mm-hmm. again with the soft tip. And just like, you know, Neil was talking earlier on the FTX, that just really helps expansion at those low speeds. And uh, so, yeah, all the subsonic line, just we got excellent expansion down to 800 feet per second. Yeah. And uh, out of a subsonic, that's 200 yards. Yeah, mm-hmm. now, further than that. Yeah, it's like shooting a 22 long rifle. So uh, you have to know what your trajectory is. But uh, inside 100 yards, man, it's, it's devastating. Yeah, it's a great time to be a, a 450 Bushmaster shooter, not only with all the bolt guns and the new bullet technology. I'm a big fan of this. This has got short barrels, needs a suppressor, and yeah. the amount of 45 caliber compatible suppressors on the market has grown dramatically in just the last couple oh, yeah. of years. Mm-hmm. I know, Neil, you have one, the yep. Hybrid 46, yep. I believe. Mm-hmm. So now you get that, that short barrel, right. you get that thumper type cartridge. And you can suppress it. Throw right. in the subsonic hunting load. Man, it doesn't get a whole lot better than that to, to be shooting a 450 Bushmaster. Yeah. yeah. And now with us sitting around talking about that, I'm looking at those two barrels. I'm going to thread them. Eh, I'm going to thread them. Yeah, I'm going to take should. them back to the shop. Yeah. We're going to thread them up right now. Yeah, yeah. And I'm going to get a 45 cal on order because I don't have a 45 cal suppressor yet. And make yeah. sure before we close this thing out, Seth, you should you should talk about the uh, the spelling error that was made on some, uh, on oh, some uh, ammo. At one yeah. Point. So, <laughs> so years ago... Uh, this would have been probably 2017 because it was right at right when I started uh, working in ballistics with Jaden. So uh, Dave Emery retired in 2016. Uh, they were a little shorthanded and, and uh, took a chance on me to work with Jaden in the lab. And uh, we kind of we shared an office and I pulled up a print for the 450 Bushmaster uh, custom 250 grain FTX. And I pulled the print open. And in the bottom right hand corner of the print, there's a text block for the name of the cartridge and other fields for different things. And uh, there was a, a fat fingered misspelling in there. And so I'm, you know, glanced at it, read it, and then I read it out loud to Jaden, who was sitting behind me, and we both just hysterically started laughing. And since that day, the 450 Bushmaster has lovingly been referred to as the 450 Bush Hamster. 
And so, uh, I, who would uh, misspell that? Anyway? I don't know. I don't remember. I don't but I can't. It smells it's of gonna, Matt George. That smells no, of Matt no, George. It would have been one of my guys. That, yeah. It would have been an engineer. So. It would have. It, it might have been. Hopefully, an intern. Maybe I don't <laughs> yeah. know. I want to say it could have been Jeremy Millard. Yeah, maybe. Uh, Jeremy's a good guy, but his sense of humor doesn't well, go that. Yeah, and yeah. I think I it think. was an honest no, mistake. I think it was an honest mistake because you just switch those around. Yeah. So well, and as we've noted, engineers are great with math, but. Yeah. Spelling, grammar, yeah, not, not always. so much with the I English. I did correct the print. You know, I ah, checked yeah. the print out, put yeah. my initials up well, there, good. name correction, that and uh, yeah, I saved everybody else. But no, internally now, it is uh, forever going to be the Bush hamster. And I think you know this might be the year that I have to uh, I have to use it on something again. Yeah, we I just got to go east. That's the yeah. thing. We just got to go east and make it happen on deer, but. Pigs, I mean, I've done that. It's been fantastic in that regard. And then the projectile, we've all used the projectile yeah. in one way, shape, form, or another. Um, but, yeah, it's a fantastic cartridge and one of those ones that, you know, it just exploded on us. It it became a huge selling product all because of, you know, things that we didn't even foresee. Right. Had no control over it yeah. all. And yep. it's, you know, we're we're happy to see it succeed because uh, – yeah, especially for you, Mitch. It's got to be quite yeah, a feather yeah, in your no, cap. Yeah, that's awesome. I See really when like your babies it. grow up. And yep. Yeah. Yep. It's got to be like, yeah, having a having a kid and, and watching them grow up playing sports, and <laughs> next thing you know, they're in the NFL yeah, or something. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's like they hit the big time now. So yeah, I'm yeah. like, yeah, that's got my name on it. That's, that's, that's yeah, pretty cool. That is pretty cool, and I appreciate you giving us that behind-the-scenes kind of Western look at how, mm. how things used to be as far as product development and how different companies come together and uh, work together to design something and get something out on the market. And as always with anything, it takes a village. There's right. a bunch yeah. of hands get so put in there. a lot in there. of people involved, a lot of people on our side, a lot of people on boom, Bushmaster's side. Um, you know, their marketing folks, their engineering team. Um, you know, we worked really closely with them on the whole thing the whole time. There was just, a, I, I then went back through my email, and yes, I still have emails from 17 years ago. Uh, there's just a plethora of emails on just back and forth. What do you think about this? Well, I'm going to send you this overnight. Um, evidently one of the guys at, uh, Bushmaster, I'm pretty sure it was Israel, uh, friends with Adam Vinatieri, who, oh, yeah. who was the field goal kicker for the Patriots yeah, during right. the Super Bowl in their heyday. Mm-hmm. Uh, everybody I, should recognize that name. I sent him a rifle in February of 07 and 200 rounds of ammo. And I never heard back, but he was going on a hog hunt, and he wanted the rounds. And so Adam Vinatieri has one of the first 450 Bushmasters as well. Huh. I hope he still got it. That's yeah. pretty neat. Yeah. Never know where your your developments are going to find themselves. Yep. Excellent. Well, is there anything else regarding the, the Bushmaster, Bush hamster, uh, that, that uh, our listeners need to know? I can't think of anything. I was just I was just really happy to work on the project, and like you guys said, it you know it is it it is one of my babies that are out there, uh, and and you know and you and I've got a firearm, and this one I have two of every cartridge that I've ever worked on, and this is the one that I probably shoot the most. That's awesome. It's also interesting to see you know there are several cartridges of the same ilk, but this is the one that stood the test of time, right, and survived. And yep. became popular. Yep. Awesome. Well, and as always, Hornady, we're always innovating. We're always trying to find, you know, the, the next best thing and how can we refine it and, you know, what, what can we do for the industry as a whole to drive us forward? And this is a prime example of that. So, guys, thanks for, for sharing all things Bushmaster. All right, thanks, Seth. Seth. Thank you. Everybody out there, hopefully you enjoyed this deep dive on the 450 Bushmaster and its uh, wonderful history. We appreciate you listening. If you would, please consider subscribing, tell a friend, send us an email, drop a comment. Uh, We'd love to hear from you, and we'll catch you on the next one.